Good morning, everyone. Am I heard? Yes, Doctor. Okay. I would like to welcome everyone to the PCP Health Forum, the Philippine College of Physicians Health Forum, which is actually a regular activity of the PCP even before the COVID attack. Now, despite the pandemic, PCP continues advocating relevant issues <clears throat> to prosper both physical and mental health. PCP regards mental health to be an integral part of total health and have made it a banner advocacy. Many of us, if not all, would agree that the circumstances in life can be stressors with or without the COVID. So today we will discuss mental health tips to keep us healthy, not only mentally, but physically, because we believe there is no physical health without mental health. Hence, we have invited an expert in the person of Dr. Vista to address our concern in a practical way. Okay, Doc, Doc, Dr. Vista is, uh, can I have the next slide please, is an associate professor of the UP College of Medicine and is the chairman of the Department of Psychiatry of the Asian Hospital and Medical Center. He's a medical director of the One Algon Place Behavioral Health Resource Center. So looking at all of his, uh, his, in this short slide, you can see that this is years of experience and we would like to thank Dr. Vista for his passion and commitment to share with us his experience and expertise in coping with life stressors that can bring fear and anxiety because our response to life stresses is what matters. So I will not delay. Um, I want you all to be ready, even with your pen and paper so you can take notes. And I advise not for you to multitask, but give this full attention because this is a very important topic. I would like to now give you Dr. Salvador Benjamin de Vista. Hello, everybody. Thanks for inviting me to share with you some of my ideas that I have used in so many settings since the pandemic descended on us. And this is a composite of my experiences at the Philippine General Hospital, at Asian Hospital, and in different other centers. And of course, with the people who have sought my help on, in the clinic. And I have put this slide set together in the hope of helping people to kind of figure out. Many individuals come to me and say, you know, Dr. Ben, I'm I think I'm depressed already, or is this an anxiety disorder already? Or, and well, I have studied them and tried to help. And in many cases, it's really not a mental illness that they're dealing with. But the feelings that COVID arouses in us are so difficult to deal with and to rationalize. So after all of this, I have decided to put it together in a slide set, which I have used for the frontliners, and uh, we call them the second victims, and of course, the direct victims of this uh, pandemic. So we've entitled it Navigating Through the New Normal, Coping at the Threshold of a New Reality. The objectives, of course, here will be to discuss the normal response of the mind to this pandemic and discuss the process of the mind faced with uncertainty and suggest processes and tools to deal with uncertainty. So let's orient ourselves initially, my friends. So of course, the stress is the pandemic and any other stress that is in your life. And of course, here is a person coping normally with the stress. And this is the area we will be talking about in this talk. We will not go into psychopathology in this talk, so I will not be talking about abnormal coping. Now, as I go through the slides and as I go through my presentation, I would also tell you that the things that I am saying can actually be 
used by you in assessing the patients whom you see, or they can also be used for you personally. And perhaps maybe it would be good as I move through the slides to think about a certain stressful thought that enters your head or is in your head at this point and maybe apply the things that I am proposing to it. So I will start with this because it is, it's, this is the basic premise on which this lecture is built. So in normal coping, we move towards an integrated or a resilient mind. So, and that mind is therefore a mind that is described in the following way. A resilient mind, an integrated mind, is mindful of three main things. The first is it's mindful of the body. The second thing is it's mindful of the mind. And the third is it's mindful of relationships. And for relationships, there are three subcategories. Relationship to other human beings, so human to human relationships. The second is what is your relationship to the environment? And the third is your relationship to God or what you conceive him to be. So let's start off with the first mental health tip. So the body. Now, one of the things I'll tell you uh, first is in order for any mind to be integrated, there must be a time in each day of an individual where there should be quiet time. And quiet time can range from maybe 30 minutes to an hour where you are just in yourself, in your thoughts. And I will make some suggestions later on on a phasing or a process during quiet time. So this needs to be done in order for us to uh, balance ourselves out. So quiet time is necessary for us to have a balanced mind. The second thing is, of course, good sleep. And, well, basic tenets there are sleep at night. Try to get in seven to eight hours of straight sleep. But although this will vary along age and, of course, work, but it's important that this happens because it's during the sleep at night where the neurotransmitters that you've used during the day when you're busy and your mind is active to return to their original places so that they can be reused the following day. The second thing is diet. Okay? So we balance the gut. The gut is usually called the second brain because it's the place where we have more neurons. You know? the, of course, the intracranial brain has the most number, but the gut is the second, and we call it the second brain because of that. And of course, you have to watch out what comes into the gut and what goes out. And of course, you look at things like the function of diet, what you put in and what comes out, and of course, the microbiota of the gut that you need to keep balanced. The second one is naturally occurring antidepressants and anti-anxiety, chemicals in our brain that we all know as endorphins that are, of course, released by vigorous exercise uh, at least 30 minutes in a day. If you can get to do that, that would be great. And of course, physically avoiding drugs, alcohol, and other addictions like social media addictions or computer gaming addictions, shopping addictions online, to just name a few. So that takes care of the basics of the body. The second one is an integrated or resilient mind is mindful of the mind. So what does that exactly mean? This leads to the mental health tip number two, and there are two mental health tips under the mind. So. Mental health tip two would be stop grieving that our old world is gone. Let me explain. 
what have we lost to COVID-19? We have lost our normalcy. What we considered normal is no longer there, or at least some of it is there, but much of it is gone. The ability to socially connect is gone. And of course, we know this, we in the medical field know this because we no longer have the usual freedom in which we link with each other. Even the capacity, for example, of a family member to watch over their loved one in the hospital, or maybe even do the usual uh, socially accepted norms of a wake and a burial have been taken away from us along with many other things. Present and future security, and many people have been consulting because they, their earning capacities have been taken away or have diminished a lot, both in the medical and non-medical field. And we know this, my friends, you know, the, the loss of persons we hold dear. So much of our former life is gone. And these losses make us grieve. And the discomfort that you're feeling many times, I'm telling you, the mixture of anxiety and depression, even crying spells and uh, even uh, panic uh, symptoms, they may not be actually mental illnesses, but they are a very important part of the grieving process. And of course, to just review with you the stages of grief. So of course, the first is shock and denial. So you remember last March, February? Now this virus won't affect us. It's, it'll just be there, away from us. And it won't probably be here in the Philippines too much. Or if it does, then you know, we can handle it. Anger, because it actually did come. And of course, the institution of the, of the lockdowns. So you're making me stay at home and taking away my activities. And of course, still there. The virus is still there. So we bargain. All right, if I social distance for two weeks, everything will be okay right but no it did not go away after two weeks then the feeling of Ay, kailan ba ito matatapos na to? so i don't know when this will end and what we want to do my dear friends is to move towards the final phase in elizabeth kubler ross's grief stages which is acceptance and saying that all right this is happening I have to figure out how to proceed. So what is more than just loss and the grief that comes with the loss is actually taking on a new shape. It's anticipating grieving over possible additional losses. And that encompasses the whole COVID feeling of both grief of what we lost and the anticipatory grief of losing even more because of the uncertainty of the situation. Unhealthy anticipatory grief, of course, is anxiety. And anxiety is our brain trying to protect itself. It's living the uncertain future in the present. And instead of using our thinking brains, we are using our feeling brain and the threat brain. So we're dealing with this. Many people are dealing with this in the threat mode which are the four Fs of fight, flight, freeze, and faint. Is grief all that bad, however? And many of you probably are familiar with Charlie Brown's famous expression, good grief. Because is really grief all that bad? Because a healthy journey from shock and denial all the way through acceptance actually makes us better persons. But it has to be a healthy journey. So how do we reach acceptance? So it's like this uh, diagram that I'm showing before you. 
we are transforming from a known reality of our past to an unknown reality. And we have to traverse this space, which we call the threshold or liminal space. And what is the liminal space? Well, if you look at it through the different anthropological definitions of it, it can mean, for example, structure, it's like transforming from chaos, establishing order, and hopefully not transferring to rigidity. But in between these three is a liminal space. Time, the time between twilight and dawn, no? when morning becomes evening and when evening transfers to mo morning. And usually this is the time for rituals because this is the usual time when the, the mind is traversing a space or a, spa a space and time in order for it to be open to change. And consciousness, of course, it can be dissociation from the present. Prescience, seers, and prophets are examples of this. And place, well, what are the places that are liminally uh, oriented or are liminal spaces? Beaches, crossroads, airports, Churches, these are places where liminality, liminality kind of happens. And of course, state, experiencing things versus observing things. This is liminality. And well, as I said, you know, time, space, this giving becoming a mother, becoming a baby from the womb to outside the womb, being a single uh, man to a married man to a father, and of course, the thresholds of life. All these are liminal spaces. And of course, getting married is one example. So the liminal space is, of course, taken from Latin for threshold. It's not knowing what will happen next and an inner state or an outer situation where we can begin to think and act in new ways. So it is an inner state or an outer situation where we can begin to think and act in new ways, like moving from one room or stage in one's life to another, as I showed you in the previous slide. When one's for own former ways of being is, being is challenged, and of course, the global pandemic, my friends, is an immense collective liminal space. So we, in order to cross the space, we have to go through the stages of grief, shock and denial, anger, bargaining, depression and anxiety, all the way to acceptance. But there is still some space to go, and we will talk about that in a little while. So, we are caught in between at least two worlds now, the one we knew and the one to come. Our consciousness and that of future generations has been changed. We cannot put the genie back in the bottle. So we're like this. We're crouched in this particular place waiting to move forward very hesitatingly because we don't know what's there. And although it's carpeted and well-lighted and looks very comfortable, it's still a scary thing. And through the fear of the uncertainty of traversing that space, I hope we don't turn to the wrong place of an exit and not move forward and just exit. And of course, it may not be as comfortable as all that. The liminal space may be scary and cold and uncomfortable. And that's many, and many of 
us are experiencing this. So, crossing over from known to unknown, the liminal, the liminal space that we need to cross to the unknown reality. But let's look at reality. And what really is reality? Well, I show this uh, very well-known caricature of the blind man and the elephant because all of us have our own definitions of what reality is. Reality is so huge that no one can fathom or even conceive of how, how really it all is. So we all have our pockets of what is real. And each individual has his own concept of what is real. And the problem with that is when we already know what is real, it's very hard to leave the definition that we put to being real. So there's a tendency for us to always want to go back. Let's go back to what was before because that one I understood. So because what is the known reality? The known reality for us, my dear friends, is based on, of course, the experience and observations that we make. And these experience and observations that we have had in our history, we choose what is relevant and what we need. Then we make assumptions on what is relevant and what we need. And these assumptions, of course, become conclusions about a certain thing or even our, our whole lives. And these conclusions become the basis, of course, for our beliefs. Now, this uh, pyramid that I'm showing you here is actually the basis for our being safe and certain. It's like a logic that is self-sealing and it protects us from all the ravages of change and crisis because we then hang on to the belief like our truth is the only truth. And it's like a bubble, a safety bubble around us, a, a self-sealing bubble that protects us from change and it protects us when critical incidents happen. So that is where we are. And many of us tend to hang on to the beliefs and not traverse the liminal space and remain in that bubble and hence are so uncomfortable now. Well, who are the people who are usually playing around with this outer margin between reality and unknown reality? Known reality and unknown reality. Well, artists do that. Through their art, they push the boundaries of reality and go into the unreal. And of course, they are seldom, uh, well, given value when they're actually expressing this. And usually, it's only later when they're probably gone that we realize that they really did come to a new truth. Comedians are examples of those people who push the boundaries of reality. So if you have that bubble, there's a tendency for you to reject change when there is something that needs to be changed, it ends up in conflict because each one in his own bubble are fighting with each other on what decisions will make me safer. And that, of course, differs because we each have a different concept of belief and we have unique reality characteristics. And what happens, therefore? The persons don't adapt individually, and the community does not adapt as well. So we describe that using liminal terminology as being in limbo. You're either stuck where you are or falling back. Or you can have a liminoid reaction to it. Taking a drug like LSD, for example, or getting drunk on alcohol every day, that would kind of immediately transform you 
into something else. But that, of course, is also as dangerous. What we need to do, my dear friends, is to deconstruct. When we're faced with something as, as formidable as COVID, we need to restudy our beliefs because we can't stay in that safe bubble that of self-sealing logic that we have or that we are used to. So we kind of need to redefine, deconstruct and redefine our beliefs. Maybe challenge the conclusions that we had before. Make the assumptions not really assumptions anymore. Change what is relevant and what we actually need. And of course, get more experiences and observe more. So paying attention to what's happening is a very important thing. That's where it all starts. So moving on to traversing the liminal space. So how does one move from the point of leaving the past or the present reality to moving forward? And of course, this is our steps in what I call outcome-oriented coping. First is acknowledge the negativity. Second is gratefully refocus to the present truth. Learn to adapt, transform, and persist. Let us look at them one by one. Step one is acknowledge the negativity. When you are bothered by something, the thinking process usually consists of either a negative or a positive component, or it can be negative thoughts and positive thoughts. But sometimes the brain in stress will not think of the positive first. It will usually focus on automatic negative thoughts first. So something's bad. something bad is going to happen. Nothing good is going to come of this. When you have that, and I want you to picture you thinking about this in quiet time. So there is an issue. So during your quiet time, you think about the thoughts. What are my negative thoughts? What are my positive thoughts about this? Because when you think the negative thoughts, there will be feelings that will go with those. And you have to acknowledge in your quiet time that those thoughts are true because feelings are usually scary and numerous like a gang of feelings don't force the feelings to go away because that just adds to the pain so if you want to get uh express your anger you you want to cry a little bit allow yourself to do that because you shouldn't push that away it will actually make your life more painful if you try to do that Acknowledge these feelings one by one. Is it anger? Is it depression? Is it sadness? Is it anxiety? Is it fear? And allow yourself a brief time to express it in a non-harmful way. Then move on to the next feeling. Step two. So your mind is there on the problem. You've expressed your feelings. Now what you need to do is gratefully refocus to the present truth yes you have lost yes it is scary but there is something that you need to be grateful for and the first thing you need to be grateful for is that you're breathing so in your quiet time you feel the breath coming in and out of your body in that way you orient your mind yes i am here i am present the breath is coming in and out of my body. Concentrate a little bit on the parts of your body that have tension and try to relax those parts one by one until you can get relaxed. Then what you do is orient yourself to the space around you. If you're doing this in your bedroom, then maybe look at the lampshade in your, in your bedstand or the bed, the chair, the table there, the light. Because the space around you and the things that you have are points to be grateful for and to give you some compassion that 
Yes, you're here in the present. And although you've lost other things, you, you still have many things. Always fight the wish to go back because that's what your mind will try to do. And of course, be kind to yourself in your quiet time. Step three. So the processing should bring you to the present. Then the step three is learn how to adapt. So what really is the problem? Or what really are the problems? What are its desired outcomes? What are the worst case scenarios? And you do a resource analysis of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And you utilize what is there to complete what is not there. Many of you are familiar with this process because uh, you have actually done this process at one point in your life, the SWOT analysis. So survival, it's not the strongest or the most intelligent that will survive, my friends. It's the ones most adaptable to change that will. So what would be step four? They're adapting. Transform what is useless and broken to what is valuable or unique. And here I have put the definition of disability on the left side so here on the right side would be the opposite of this so what is transformation you transform this ability into ability so this ability can be the crushing of a spirit so what must you do so that your spirit can be uplifted you may be losing hope so what must you do to bring back hope Maybe your natural curiosity of the world is no longer there. Then what must you do to bring that back? You may not be able to see beauty anymore. So maybe look at the beautiful and appreciate the beautiful. Depre deprivation of imagination and dreams. So what must one do to bring back the capacity to imagine and to have dreams? And of course, removing pride or dignity. What must a person do to have, regain his pride and his dignity? Because disability, my dear friends, is the genesis of creation. So creativity in this pandemic, we all need to be doing that. And of course, step five would be persist. You must keep your expectations realistic you have to keep reminding yourself of your own power as well as the limits of control so set the limits around that keep renewing your competence learn a new skill learn more about your skills learn more get more knowledge and of course when you're disappointed because you will get disappointed reminders of being humble in the face of disappointment or defeat so traversing the liminal space, therefore, my dear friends, the steps would be acknowledge the negativity, gratefully refocusing to the present truth, learn to adapt, transform, and persist. Now there you have it until this point. We, but we have not crossed the river yet because it's acceptance really enough. By doing what I suggested, you would probably reach the point of acceptance. But is that enough to move us forward into the unknown reality? Maybe not. Because we must move forward instead of just preventing ourselves from feeling lost or the losses that we have had. We need to move forward. And choosing not to suffer from inevitable pain of uncertainty is one of the things we need to do. And the only way that we can do that, my friends, is not only to accept what we lost, but to find a new meaning in the suffering. Because he really who has a why to live can bear any how. So I will add to the grief stages. And I will say, Shock and denial, anger, bargaining, sadness, 
acceptance. We need to add meaning. How does this pandemic change the purpose of my life? And of course, responsibility. What must I do to realize that purpose? So meaning and responsibility. And of course, everybody I think is familiar with the Sermon on the Mount, which actually gave a very nice definition of the meaning and responsibility of a human life. Not merely following rules or commandments, but striving towards the best good. Now we go to the third part, which is an integrated mind is mindful of their relationships. Mental health tip number four. So take care of your relationships. Human to human relationships, your relationship with the environment, and your relationship with God. Human relationships. What are the values that will help us here? One is gratitude, which is called the mother of all values. I told you about this earlier during your quiet time. When you think about all the things that bother you, one of the first things that you do is orient yourself to the gratitude of the present. The next value, of course, is sacrifice. And many of us in the medical field are doing this right now. And the value of sacrifice is in actually saying that the more you sacrifice, then the greater the reward will be. And that's why we do the sacrifice. Forgiveness. Many people who are angry need to work on this because forgiveness is the only antidote to anger. And if there are angry people, or if you yourself are angry, then consider forgiveness as the anti-toxin. Sharing. And well, this will help with our economy. If you have extra, then give. Because there's no other way we will get out of this economic depression except by sharing with each other. And of course, my dear friends, Proper communication to the ones around us is the key to having good human relationship. Taking care of others in the best way you would take care of yourself. So that answers the question, so how should I take care of my brother? Well, take care of others in the best way you could take care of yourself. And be responsible for yourself and who you care about today tomorrow, next month, and next year. And of course, this is, of course, instantiated in this Bentoism figure that I am showing to you, where you have, you actually can do this on a piece of paper. No? So here on this axis, you have your self-interest. And of course, on this axis, you have time. And so what is your self-interest self for the now me? And what is the self-interest in the now us? In other words, the people whom you work with, the people whom you live with, uh, the people whom you come into contact with. And of course, here is a definition of the things in the future me and the future us. Now we go to the environment, relationship with the environment. And to just describe this, I will just show two slides. It's a text message. I think some of you have read this from Jonathan Smith, no? an epidemiologist from Yale University. And it says, let me please read. First, we are in the very infancy of this epidemic's trajectory. That means even with these measures, we will see cases and deaths continue to rise globally, nationally, and in our own communities in the coming weeks. Our hospitals, as we see them today, will be overwhelmed and people will die that didn't have to. This may lead to some people to think that the social distancing measures are not working. They are. They may feel futile. They aren't. You will feel discouraged. You should. This is normal in chaos, but it is also normal epidemic 
trajectory. Stay calm. This enemy that we are facing is a very good at what it does. We are not failing. We need everyone to hold the line as the epidemic inevitably gets worse. This is not my opinion. This is the very unforgiving mass of epidemics for which I and my colleagues have dedicated our lives to understanding with great nuance. And this disease is no exception. We know what will happen. I want to help the community brace for this impact. Stay strong and with solidarity, knowing with absolute certainty that what you are doing is saving lives, even as people begin getting sick and dying. You may feel like giving in. Don't. So the relationship with the environment. So let's do what needs to be done. Wear the mask. Social distancing. Wash your hands and don't cheat. Then finally, strengthening our belief in God. So as I mentioned before, sacrifice the undesirable to redeem yourself and be a transcendent force for good. And finally, the mental health tip five. And the last one is, it's okay to seek help when you are not okay. So to summarize, five tips are, take compassionate care of your body. Stop grieving that our old world is gone. Find a new meaning and new responsibility. Take care of your relationships, and it's okay to seek help when you are not okay. And so I end with this slide, and I think everybody knows what this is. It's the enterprise of Star Trek, and of course, it, see, it says, keep calm and boldly go. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Vista, for walking us through the steps uh, that we can take as we navigate through the uncertainties, uncertainties of life. Thank you very much. And I guess You're all welcome. the listeners, yeah, all the listeners have um, kind of peeked into what you really need to do to keep us mentally healthy. And um, that's why PCP is an advocate for this because as doctors or those who are not doctors listening, we have to bridge the gap between what we know as doctors and what we feel ourselves and what our patients or our loved ones or our friends around us would be feeling. So then if you understand that, then we reduce the stigma. We uh, are able to reduce our the stigma of... of um, mental health. So thank you again, Dr. Vista. And, My pleasure. Um, yeah, I do hope that there are some people here who would ask questions. But uh, as everyone agrees, as you've seen on the chat box, um, it was very informative and very insightful. Thank you again. And so those who find it insightful, I'm sure uh, PCP would uh, give you a, the slide set or probably a summary of it so that you can go through it. I know one going through one 40 minutes of the lecture might not sink in that well, but um, we have gained so much insight and thank you again. There's a question here that I would throw to you, Dr. Vista. What is your advice to parents of children with special needs during this time of the COVID-19 pandemic? This is from Claudette Mokon Siriaco of the Business Mirror. Thank you. Oh, yes. Uh, well, thank you for the question. And um, yeah, there really are vulnerable populations heightened by the pandemic. And the needs of these vulnerable populations really have become more complicated. Well, the first one, of course, is the one on the far end of the spectrum, and that's where I belong, <laughs> the senior citizen part. And even uh, the senior citizens are uh, hard put you know, to kind of stay where they are. And uh, on the other end of the spectrum, of course, are the children. And even more vulnerable in the children's group would be the children with special needs. So how I would answer your question is, you know, going back to the lecture and 
you know that part where I talked about paying attention. Because you need now to form another definition of what are the needs now? What is happening now? And you have to observe. Because from those observations, then you can move on to making conclusions. You can move on to making assumptions. And you have to change your belief system. The former belief system you had before COVID in dealing with your special child must now change. It must take on a different picture. And I'm, I'm sorry to say, but it's actually you who should make those observations and make those changes and transform your beliefs. So maybe I would say first is pay attention. Ano ba ang mga bagong pangangailangan ng iyong special loved one? Whether it be a child or an adult. Paano sila nagre-react ngayon? Paano sila uh, sa araw-araw? Ano ba yung nag-iiba sa kanila? And you have to write that down. And when you see them behaving in a uh, like they did when COVID was not here, then you have to figure it out. Diba? So what can I assume from this behavior now? And what can I conclude from this behavior now? So ano ang bago kong paniniwala? Ano ang bagong belief na I can do for this special one now that COVID is here? Because you know, my dears, this thing won't go away soon. And so the only thing we need to have, and what, as I said in the lecture, you know, it's beliefs that get us through, but right now we need to change those beliefs. So in summary, to answer the question, Paul, pay attention to me. And conclusions regarding the new needs, and then move forward into changing your beliefs and changing the way you deal with the problem. I hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd just like to share first a comment here that um, from Celestial Tubig. She says that this is very helpful to us because she is connected with children. And um, they would Good want to you. know. Yeah. And Janice Atienza says that, would you have any suggestions on how we can address the anxiety of teenagers during this pandemic? And they feel lost and afraid. Yes, well, that's another special group. And the adolescents, not just teenagers, but adolescents, and the definition of adolescent is from age 13 to 24. And I'll tell you, this, this is really a special group because from age 13 to 24, the human brain undergoes so many structural and functional changes. I mean, we can spend another two hours talking about what these changes are, but they are neither a child nor are they an adult. And so you need to treat them in a rather uh, unique way. So uh, to just make the, the answer short, one of the things about adolescents is they're in the stage of life where they actually, not because they're doing it on purpose, but because of a genetically uh, switched on mechanism of actually being more independent. So they unintentionally push away from their parents. So kung masunurin sila noong bata pa sila, for some reason na hindi mo alam, nagbago na sila. At ayaw na nilang sumunod sa iyo. Hindi ito ibig sabihin na they have become bad. No. They are just following the course of the genetic uh, orders. Now, all mammals have an adolescent period where the, the offspring must push away from the parent because they need to learn how to survive. The problem now, my dears, is this. How can somebody push away from the parent 
no? Kasi ang gagawin ng mga normal adolescents noon, push away from the parent and then cleave to the barkada. The barkada are very important to me. Hindi na importante yung sinasabi ni mommy, hindi na importante yung sinasabi ni daddy, teacher, hindi ko na. Yung barkada ko ang sinusunod ko. Yan ang normal na psychological set ng adolescent. But now, how can they do that? Where can they go? There, the virus has said, stay there at home. So what do they do? They still try to link with their barkada using the social media. And sometimes it gets so overwhelming that they don't sleep properly anymore. They don't eat properly anymore. They, they don't take care of their bodies. And what I told you in the lecture is, you need to take care of your body. You need to sleep properly, you need to eat properly, you need to exercise. So, hindi mo pagbawalan, kasi ang, ang kaguluhan ng karamihan ng mga adolescents, hindi sila makatambay sa kanilang tribo. Ang tambay nila ngayon, virtual. They, they do it virtually. And that's frustrating. Because a, a virtual tambay is not the same as an actual physical tambay like we used to do before. It doesn't give them the same satisfaction. So they're really going to be irritable. And you must not stop them from linking up with their peer group. In fact, you should encourage it. Because why? As an adult, paslamat na lang tayo, hindi lalabas ng bahay yan. Kasi ang batas, sabi na, Wag kang lumabas. But you should also not restrict them because it's a psychological, a neurological need for them to do that. So you can say, yes, anak, you can go ahead and talk to your friends over the social media, but you stick to the schedules of making your body integrated. Sleep on time. Probably not too much gadgets at night because you... You confuse your brain when it's a gadget in front of you past 6 in the evening. Blue light, diba? So the, the brain will think it's still uh, morning, which is not true. I said the spectrum of light should be yellow and orange now so that the brain will start slowing down through the pineal gland and melatonin. So try to... Tell them, you can do the social media, you can be on your gadget, but once you reach your bedtime, even after dinner, wag na muna yung mga gadgets. So, uh, the brain will be given a chance to slow down and sleep on time. Adolescents really need eight hours of sleep. And you will say, ang hirap niyan, Dr. Ben, kasi yung mga schools ngayon, ang online schooling, parang... <laughs> hindi na makatao yung mga assignment na binibigay ng mga mga, mga eskwela ngayon dun sa mga online. That is true and I want this forum to start thinking about that and reaching out to the people who are teaching our young people to coordinate themselves. They may be over-assigning things. They need to talk to each other, the teachers. But I digress. So, what I mean is, if in dealing with this, you need to understand the adolescents. Hindi yan mga pasaway na gusto nilang maging pasaway. Hindi, they're doing something that they need really developmentally to do. But right now, they're a little bit frustrated. So it's a time also, adolescence is a time of emotional upheaval. No? So they, they, their moods swing. So you need to be the calming presence there. Not to judge, not to call them names, not to punish them, but to be beside them and to assure them that you will be there no matter what. And probably that's the short answer that I can give. But we can, we can talk about the adolescents in you know the whole day. <laughs> and we, won't, we won't be able to talk about everything regarding them. But they really are a special group. So we must still love them and just keep on loving them and 
trusting them and making sure that they have the right values. So I guess that would be my answer. Rather long, I'm sorry, but yeah. That's a, that was a very needed answer. We even want to hear more. That's why there's uh, one uh, psychologist here, Dr. Jocelyn Del Mundo says, thank you very much, Dr. Vista. You're the best, one of my favorite doctors. God bless you. And the lecture was very informative. Yeah, it was very concise and meaningful. There's another one who said that, Teresita Colas. Now, there's another question here that from Catherine May Hamtig, she asks for a hypochondriac patient who further feels powerless, weak, um, something physical, some uh, somatizing physical symptoms during the pandemic. What advice can you give given that organic causes have been ruled out? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Thank you for that. Because uh, nowadays, there are so many kinds of uh, mental disorders coming from the COVID. Uh, one of them is hypochondriasis. The other one that's evolving is what they call a health anxiety disorder. Okay, so this has been heightened now because of really the the, the pandemic, and I'm I'm glad the question ended with once you rule out a medical condition, because this is where the behavioral uh, crosses over into the medical or the physical, because one of the first things that you will do for a patient who is who has unexplained somatic complaints who has hypochondriacal thinking. And by the way, uh, what is hypochondriasis? Well, the person complains or thinks that they are, they are suffering from a severe medical condition of some sort. Okay? Unexplained somatic complaints is, you know, uh, uh, complaints, for example, like pain that transfers from one part of the body to the other every day. So, I'm glad the question I said after you've ruled out because that's the first thing you do to help these people. Medyo mahal siya. Kasi you have to go to a, an internist perhaps or a, 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 a doctor who will look at all the laboratories, do all the diagnostics to rule everything out. Okay. So, uh, once you've ruled everything out, then it remains to be now a behavioral, psychological, psychiatric condition. Now, so what will the... And, and I would suggest that you really bring them for help. And that's the mental health tip number five. It's okay, pag rule out na lahat, it's okay to bring this person to a specialist in, in mental health so that it can be dealt with. I will not deal anymore with why they become that way. It's really based on a combination of their experience growing up, their personality profiles, and the, um, the condition that they find themselves now. So I won't go into the details of the psychology for it, but I will say if you have somebody or you know somebody who is like that, then you rule out all the medical first and then you refer to a psychiatrist or a psychologist to help them through the medical condition. Now, uh, the psychiatric condition or the psychological condition. Sometimes they can... The time is uh, 11 o'clock a.m. It can be handled just through talk therapy, where a psychologist would probably do. But there are those who need pharmacotherapy as well as psychotherapy. And that is where psychiatrists would come in. Okay. Thank you very much. I hope that answered the question. That's, again, a very big umbrella to answer. Mm -hmm. And I think Dr. Vista is passionate about linking you know, taking care of mental health also in our medical practice. Yeah. So if there are internists here, we're, we're looking for people who are interested to join the psychosomatic group, meaning we want to look into mental illness that are just waiting to be diagnosed in our clinics. We don't recognize them because we are not equipped. So through Dr. Vista's passion to educate 
and to spread this uh, advocacy, we will start to learn how to identify these people because they might just be presenting the hypochondriacs might be in a depressive state. Is that correct, Dr. Vista? And yeah. I've known that the World Health Organization said that about 60% of our pa of patients we see in our clinics can be in a depressive state. And that's amazing, right? Because hey, mental illness now accounts for about one third of the world's disability caused by adult health problems. So as internists, as a group, the Philippine College of Physicians, I guess we have a responsibility to look at all our patients as well, um, not just physical, but look at their mental health because there's no physical health without mental health, correct, Dr. Vista? Now, there's yeah. one, yeah, yeah, thank you. There's uh, one from a from the media, from Christine Sabilio of ABS-CBN. She asks, what can people do to connect with others, especially now that they cannot go outside and meet their friends? Is, this, is talking online enough? And uh, maybe corollary to that from an anonymous attendee is, is asking um, advice with a fast pace that they live, such as, such as journalists who are experiencing stress during their coverage of the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, so... <clears throat> how does one connect? And uh, you are very right who answer who, who asked the question. You are very right that the pandemic really has limited our ability to connect socially with others. But if you look at it, and this is my my opinion only, and you, you may think differently, but you have to look, we have to look beyond just our condition and the message for us, perhaps coming from God himself, I don't know, or by nature. Pero right now, kasi, ang mensahe na, na naririnig ko, pagtibayin muna natin pamilya natin. Okay. So, I know, I know many people have come to consult me kasi they are now forced to stay for a long time with their spouse and they hate that for some reason. There are, some, there are some families that need to come online with me and talk about how to fix it because the pandemic isolation, they having to be forced to live together every day is creating so much chaos in everyone. But I think we need to listen to this. And the first thing we need to work on my dear friends, is communicate with your family first. But as I said in answering the previous question, there are some members of our family who are in the adolescent range, and they really need to connect with others. And you're asking me, pwede na ba yung social media, online connections? I don't know. Probably not. And this is something that we need to monitor moving forward. But as much connection that we can give them, the better. Even the playing around with children. You know, the, the, the children who cannot go out and play with the neighbors now, uh, it, it's not a very good thing developmentally for them. So we will really need to move forward observing all of this. Kasi hindi ko talaga alam kung adequate na ang online communication. Now on the second uh, question, on people who are in a fast-paced kind of a fast-paced kind of a job that demands you, you know, moving forward fast. Ang sasabihin ko sa inyo, well, where are you doing it from? Because as I observe the people whom I talk to in the clinics and elsewhere, what is emerging now is not just the speed of the demand for you. It's where do you do it? Are you doing it from home or are you doing it in work? Because iba ang buhay manager kasi nasa bahay ka pwede na kitang utusan at utusan at utusan kahit hating gabi pwede kitang bigyan ng 
utos o kaya magmi-meeting tayo ng alas stress ng madaling araw kasi work from home ka eh. Which I think is a very wrong thing. no? So, it's not only the speed, but where you are. Now, dealing with the speed, a lot of things can happen now in a very quick way, unlike before. Like what? A meeting like this. Imagine how many people are sitting in on this meeting now. 76. There are 76 people listening to this meeting now. Would that have been done as easily before as now? No. So we can get a lot of things done because of the internet, speed-wise. But it's not speed that's the issue here, my dears. It's the how we do the speed. Where do we do it from? What time are we doing it? Because as I go back to the talk that I made. If you're going online at 3 in the morning for uh, something, a business something, a business meeting, pag-isipan mo yun kasi hindi mo inaalagaan ang computer mo. Ito, dito, ang computer na dinadala mo kung saan-saan. You are not being mindful of your of your body and i go i go to the companies and i preach this to the companies and happily naman some of them really do follow i say preach because it's really preach because <laughs> you, you you have to strike the fear of god into them before they change I say you're, I'm, I'm telling them you're, you're ruining the mental health of your employees. You know, you give them work from home and then you think, ah, work from home ka naman. Ang hirap kaya mag work from home. Diba? Instead of going to work at 8 o'clock and then you don't think about the house and then just go back to the house at 5, now, 9 o'clock, you're doing your work. Kakatok kasi mag-deliver ng gasol. Oh, yung dalawang anak mo umiiyak. Kailangan pupunta doon, change the diaper, feed the, this one and the other older one is online. So, mama, sabi ng teacher ko, kailangan akong gumawa ng ganyan. Can you imagine somebody in a position like that? So, this has not been thought of. So, uh, I'm sorry but I twisted the question a little bit but it's not really the speed or maybe you're saying it's the speed but it's not the it's not the speed trajectory. It's the volume of what you need to do now. Dumadami siya lalo. So that is the truth. And I hope that, well, thank you for uh, letting me answer that question. Kasi if you notice, I have become a little bit, you know, kind of emotional about it. Because I see many people really who are suffering because this is not readily seen by uh, the, the, the workplace. So, siguro, I'll stop there before I start to rant. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. That was really, really very relevant. Um, and um, that's what everybody's uh, putting in the chat box here. And I like one who said, Demosthenes Lumabi says, that is acknowledging our helplessness and surrendering to a supreme being helpful. And uh, Dr. Vista just said that. No? We have to, if you have to, want to add to that, but I guess what really is hitting everyone now is how to deal with our adolescents online. It says here, more on dealing with adolescents. What, with, what are the telltale signs that an adolescent is depressed, especially if they can be withdrawn and they spend most of their time on their gadgets? Also telling a teenager to sleep early or to exercise or to eat properly re realistically is very challenging. Any special tips, measures that parents can try with adolescent children? Hmm. Yeah, well, as I said, you know, um, sometimes or mostly, this, this group, as I said, doesn't listen to parents very much. So one of the things I always teach my, the parents of adolescents is, don't be the enemy of your child. Okay? And you will say, pwede ba yung Dr. Vista na magiging 
barkada ako. Hindi. Hindi ko sinasabi na magiging barkada ka. Pero you can become more barkada-like and less parent-like. And that will kind of give you a little bit. Little bit. I'm not saying it will solve the problem. It'll, it'll, it'll give you a little bit of inroad into their psyche. Because what will that do? First of all, it'll make you cool. It will make you so cool that even their friends, whom they actually consider their authority, will actually kind of talk to you more. They won't isolate you because you're a cool to you more. You can't come in and be authorita- authoritative the way you were when they were little kids. You have to be more sabi ko nga barkada like. Now how do you tell when they're depressed? Well, if you can get close enough to them and really give them the the idea that you're not there to change how they think and feel, but rather you're there to support them in how they're thinking and they're feeling. Because that's what we really should do naman din. Then they'll probably communicate to you more. Isolation for an adolescent is usually normal. In fact, I have an adolescent myself, and you know it's very normal for them to you know bring a, a gadget to the dinner table, and while you're having a lively discussion, they're there, you know, consumed by the gadget. And of course, if you if you tell them put the gadget down, you know you're uncool. So you don't. And you say, well, maybe the person whom you're having a discussion with there can join here in the family because we'd like to ask them a few questions too. (laughs) So, in other words, what I'm trying to tell you guys is you ally yourselves with them. And it's very hard because you're used to dealing with them in the authoritative way that you did when they were 0 to 12 years old. And that's the thing you that's the belief that you need to deconstruct. Once they reach 13, mag-iiba talaga yan. At kung hindi ka mag-iiba at hindi ka magbago, eh nagbabago sila. Kaya dapat ikaw magbago ka rin. <laughs> Baguhin mo yung mga paniniwala mo. You have to deconstruct your beliefs regarding your relationship with them. It's hard. And sometimes when you don't know what to do, then you you call a mental health expert, the nearest one that you can get, and get some advice. But uh, really, the, the concept that I told you in the talk regarding deconstructing, that for an adolescent, all parents have to deconstruct. And it's very hard to do. I have parents who are consulting me who are deep. Ano bang nangyari? Napakabait yan noon. Sumusunod yan kahit anong sasabihin ko. Masipag sa pag-aaral kasi sinasabi ko. Ngayon, hindi na sumusunod. Kahit masasabihin ko nalang na kumain ka na, ayaw pa rin sumunod. So you have to start deconstructing, my dears. So pay attention to them. If they are lalo na yung harmfulness, you have to get close to them enough so that they will be okay with telling you that they are harming themselves. Because harming themselves does not really actually mean suicidal. For an adolescent, no. There is what we call non-suicidal self-harm. And that is not a person who wants to kill themselves. No. It's somebody who is trying to deal with the highly emotional nature of their stage of life. But you need to know that. You need to differentiate that. And the only way you will do it is you deconstruct your own parenting style. Now, move on to the next question. If you have, what if you have children at different stages of life? You have a young one, say maybe five, six, seven years old, and then you have an adolescent all in the same house. What, what will I say? There has to be rules. 
but the way you uh, the, the rules should not change right the, the rules are the rules but the way you deal with the pre-adolescent child and the adolescent child the way you implement the rules should be different bearing in mind what i just told you about the adolescent brain they're your children guys they're not bad because you brought them up some things just happening that you don't understand and i hope that listening to me will somehow give you a little inkling on understanding them a little bit more okay thank you for that question yeah that was really good you know christine mangiera says thank you so much for enriching our wisdom that's why i think a lot of the listeners here are raising adolescent kids but there's yeah. one question here oh, yeah I was asking about probably the other age group now would be an early retirement be a good option for an abled elderly that's a question from conrado diestro okay the stress naman of those in the senior age group Yeah, well, that's where I am. So thank you for asking. I'm an expert there. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, and I'll tell you frankly. You know, I'm 61 years old, and I, when this when this thing came and all of the changes that happened with it, I actually thought about just maybe I should stop and just retire. And then uh, that that was a fleeting thought because why wouldn't one think that? I mean, society itself is curtailing what you can do. But of course, I said that's a that's a thought that comes from a safety bubble. What I referred to in the talk. What is the safety bubble there? That I cannot do anything except what I have been doing. And so, following the message of the talk, we need to burst that bubble. Because now, what is COVID teaching us, as seniors? Maybe we need to find the other meaning in our life. And I'm telling you, many doctors, well, I know a few who have been consulting me. And they're saying, I don't think I can practice in the next two years, Ben. You know, I, I'm an ophthalmologist, and I've given up on seriously, you know, practicing uh, my my craft in the next two years. And so, to make a long story short, well, if you can accept that, and you accept that as a loss. Then you redefine yourself and redefine a new meaning. And I'll tell you, this ophthalmologist said to me, one of the things that I always loved to do was to bake. And so what they did was they increased their knowledge. They increased their what did I say in the talk? You have to learn new things, increase competence. So they went online, got a certificate as a baker, and now they're happily baking and sending, and earning money sending uh, baked products online. They'll probably go back to their practice later on when it's all right to practice already. But this is what I mean by finding it's not just accepting that things are gone. It's changing the meaning and purpose so that you have a new responsibility for yourself and that's what that's one part of it the other part of it is you know guys before i used to take for granted that i'd leave the house very early in the morning and come home late and that was just a normal thing but now i can't do that anymore and i'm You know, kind of confined to the house more than less. But you know what? The other value is now that I have discovered that's so priceless. I know my children now. I know my grandchild now. I sit with him during class, and I can see him growing up. And these, oh my God, these moments are so 
fantastically priceless. Because really, my dears, everybody listening here, ano ba talaga ang pinaka-valuable na commodity dito sa ating buhay? It's time. It's not money. Not anything else. It's time. You young people are lucky because you have your millionaire spy. Pero kami, hindi na kami millionaires. Di ba? Kung baga, kami, nasa ano lang, barya na lang yung nasa bulsa namin. So we need to value that time. Whatever time is left. And that time will probably better be spent, you know, really forming bonds and relationships with our family and the people who matter to us. So that's how I will answer the question about the senior. And uh, I hope I, I answered that. Thank you for the question also. Yeah, that was a good question. And thank you so much. It really is uh, real no? that COVID is also giving us the time that was so elusive to us before. Mm -hmm. Time, as you said, is very important and we should uh, shift our you know, purpose and meaning in life. And I guess it's really bringing us all back to our belief in the Lord, that He is fully in control and things will be okay but if it's not okay we have ways to be okay right but there's a uh, knowing that I mean, it's really fear and worry that pervades all the you know, the situation that we are all in uh, because we're concerned of our health most of the questions that have been posted here dr vista is all about how to de deal with fear and anxiety and worry and uh, how, how sleep affects does it you know, changes in sleep and eating patterns, does, does it affect mental health? I think you explained that. And is it adding to their difficulty in sleeping? Is it causing worsening of their problems, health problems, or other mental health challenges? There are a lot of questions and we have a little time left. But in a nutshell, that's really the concern of majority. It's what the COVID is causing us to feel now fear and anxiety and uncertainty how to deal with that and yes. work from home there's one who says that are you advocating work from home or not are you saying that it's not a good thing or is a good thing this is from uh, some red mendoza from the manila times asking about um, working from home causing mental stress as well yeah well it's all uh, it's all an adaptation no uh it, it it's the pain of having to adapt and uh, i am i'm sorry no i i please do not misconstrue uh, my words as being advocating for this and advocating for that i just bring out what the problems are that i see okay i'm not saying it's bad because how can you say work from home is bad when the whole covid thing has dictated work from home. So we need to obey that somehow. But what I am trying to do is not advocate for anything, or maybe I am. The advocacy that I will, I, I will say is the advocacy of paying attention and not just reacting emotionally to everything. Seeing things in a, if work from home, then being honest about, yeah, it's stressful, so I need to kind of express this. So, bago kasi siya, so medyo mahirap siya, kasi it's change. And we are in the process now of change. So, you, you remember the liminal space. So when it comes to your work life now, you are also in a liminal space. You're trying to traverse the going to the office thing with now the work from home thing. So that's the liminal space that you need to traverse. And when you do that, you need to follow the, or you have a choice to follow the suggestions I made, which is pay attention, no, you, you'll be you'll be feeling angry about something. No, go go through the go through the 
the pangs and the steps of grief and anticipatory grief. And be very honest to yourself about it and communicate this perhaps to your company. If it's getting really overwhelming and you can't do it by yourself, then as I said, the mental health tip five, it's okay to seek help when you don't feel okay. So know your friendly neighborhood mental health professional. There are many online uh, uh, platforms now that you can use and talk to someone about it so that it can be dealt with in an objective sort of way, okay? And the mental health professionals are, are willing to help in any way we can, okay? Yeah, thank you very much. Again, Dr. Vista, I'm sure uh, the one who asked, uh, asked that question was enlightened. There really a lot here, like um, Bell Susara of Radio Aguila is really asking that as well, fear, anxiety, stress in this pandemic. And Conrado Gestro who asked about the retirement, wants you to know that he's a proud uh, SU, Silliman University alumnus. Yay! Yay, Dr. Vista and I are both from Silliman University, <laughs> if we will say that here. But um, there's one from uh, Christine Sabilio again, asking that, you know, um, globally, it's being said that world experts say that the second wave of the pandemic is actually the rising rates of mental health and substance use disorders. Do you agree with this? What can we do to prevent this? Yeah, well, wonderful. Uh, yes, the statistics are showing that. But I'll tell you, uh, ma'am, the, the epidemic of depression and substance abuse has even preceded the pandemic, this viral, viral pandemic. You know, and uh, well, it's always been our advocacy, and I'll include Dr. Erlin here, to somehow deal with that. So even before COVID came, there already was an epidemic of, of depression and, and substance abuse, addiction. Is it heightened now that COVID is here? Definitely. Because isolation itself is a very big stress. Not being able to be free to do what you want, that's a very big stress. And so the most likely negative or what do we call um, uh, negative reactions would be depression and addiction. And I don't have any hard facts. The only facts that I have are in my own personal experience in the clinics. And I'm telling you, no. Uh, the, the other, the only other uh, one I re read was um, a an article saying, uh, you know, self harm has risen double you know, what it was before the pandemic. And there are many reasons for that. Uh, we can we can go on and on about about isolation, how that what what that does to a person. You know, there's a lot of abuse that happens there. There's a lot of uh, violence, actually, that happens there. There's uh, isolation itself is, is something that's really very, very stressful. So, yeah, I agree with you. And uh, we, that's why persons like myself, and although <laughs> Dr. DeMary is a cardiologist, but I think she's a... <laughs> She's a psychiatrist, you know, kind of. <laughs> she's, a, she's really a psychiatrist who, who, who has covered herself birth. with a, a, a psychiatrist since birth, but who has covered herself in cardiologists' uh, robes. So, but yeah, so we really need to double time. And I think this session with you today is our little effort to try to deal with that in our own little way. Because we all need 
Na alam niyo yung ano, yung yung image ng everybody seen the Viking shield wall. You remember the the Vikings, di ba? So they had a shield, uh, usually bilog, and then a spear or a, an axe. And when somebody would attack, they would form a shield wall, di ba? They they put all their shields side by side so that any attacker could not penetrate into the shield wall. That's what we need to do as mental health practitioners. We need to build, build the shield wall around the vulnerable. And that's the people who are depressed and are suicidal because of it and those who are, who are addicted to something and who are dealing with the, the pain in their life by addiction. That's who we need to protect. So, yeah. So we need to be working harder to do that. Thank you for reminding us. Thank you, Dr. Vista. And I think it's, uh, it's just appropriate to say that um, for the doctors in this, in this forum, we would really want to heighten our awareness for mental health. It's especially now that the COVID-19 has mandated drastic changes in the way we deliver medical services. Okay, social distancing and all of that has caused you know, psychosomatic changes or, or feelings of anxiety, or whatever, or hypochondriasis in our patients. And if we do not take care of our mental health, then we cannot also take care of our patients' mental health. So this initiative of the PCP is uh, made urgent and vital because of COVID pandemic. And we thank Dr. Vista for really opening this link between internists and psychiatrists because we need to identify these people who need our help so that they will feel safe with us, that it's okay not to be okay. And it is the hope that this will be the model of care for medical, for us doctors as we take care of, because we are really frontliners in our clinics, right? To take care of the mental health of patients. And thank you, Dr. Vista, for always saying that we need to put a new meaning into our lives. We need to connect, okay? We need to be mindful body, mind, and relationships, family, friends, and our God. So we would like to really thank you, Dr. Vista, because there are more questions here. I hope we can we can probably email these people. Sure. But um, before yeah, before we close, I would like to thank Dr. Malidin Biruar, our champion regent, who is the committee head of the media communications and the chair. Ginger Lita Samonte, Dr. Ginger Lita Samonte, thank you so much for giving us the forum for mental health today. And we hope that you know the PCP will continue to guide the public on mental health awareness so there will be less stigma. For indeed, we should not look at mental health as something like a taboo, like we should not talk about it, you know, because we cannot have a body without a mind. So we have to take care of our mind. So thank you again very much, Dr. Vista, and maybe your parting words before we um, call this forum to a close. Yeah, well, Sigo, um, I'll just thank everybody for taking the time to be brave enough to talk about mental health. And um, at the end of the day, the situation that we're in can really be dealt with medically, perhaps, or maybe politically, perhaps, or maybe socially, perhaps. But at the end of the day, it's really God whom we need to focus on. And I guess I'll end there. We need, to, we need to deconstruct our old beliefs about God. And we need to make them stronger now. Thank you very much again. And God bless everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Vista. Thank you, everyone, for um, tuning in. This um, forum will be made available in uh, FB. And I think in YouTube. So for those who haven't really um, digested the entire forum, we invite you to go to the PCP website or the PP PCP.
Facebook page. Again, thank you very much and to God be the glory. Thank you, Dr. Vista. Bye. Take care, Bye. everybody. Bye. Stay safe.